for today. So um, let me first welcome everyone to our April Innovation Leadership Forum. I'm Alan Lubitz. I'm the co-founder and forum mentor, uh, uh, moderator. And we're in our third year as an executive peer group. And from time to time, we substitute one of our monthly members only meetings with a topic that warrants a broader invitation list like this one. A few months ago, we did a two-part series on cybersecurity, and today we're focusing on healthcare, uh, both its unique characteristics as well as the challenges that it shares in common with many, if not all, of the businesses and organizations that are represented by our member companies. So uh, since we have so many guests today, I'd like to welcome you all. Thank you for joining us. Uh, as I said, it may be one of our largest groups ever, and we appreciate you making the time to participate with us today. Uh, with so many people on Zoom, I won't uh, do my usual introductions of everybody, uh, but I will take just a moment, if you'll indulge me, to say a few words about this forum, since there are many of you who aren't familiar with it. Um, as I said, we've been, we're have been we in our third year. We present important topics aimed at sharpening our leadership skills, and uh, we discuss common challenges and creative ideas. We bring in experts from diverse fields. Uh, we try to broaden our knowledge and our network uh, through these experts as well as our fellow members. And uh, we have uh, quite a lot of folks uh, now in the group. Um, coming up next month, Wednesday, May 18th, we're going to have as our speaker, Dr. Uh, William Crawford, who's going to share insights on neuroscience and how that helps us better handle stress, be happier, improve our problem solving and be better visionary leaders. And then the following month on Thursday, June 23rd, we'll have Lawrence O'Toole speaking about emotional intelligence and its practical application. And that'll be a noteworthy meeting because I think it will be the first one that we're gonna to try to really do in person or at least a hybrid. So uh, we're looking forward to that. Um, if you'd like to know more about this organization, uh, if you want to become a member or just get invited to some future events, uh, please send a Zoom chat to me during this meeting and I'll, I'll reach out to you. Um, we have, there's no cost for this organization. And the reason because of the, that we are able to do that no cost is because we have a very uh, nice benefit of having Technosis as our sponsor. Uh, and not only a sponsor, but really the co-creator of this organization. So I well, a great debt of gratitude to my friend Kevin Castle for his vision uh, and his help in co-founding this group and running it. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to throw the ball over to Kevin and have him introduce our moderator today as I'm not going to be doing that those duties myself today. Kevin? Yeah, thank you, Alan. Thanks for handing the mic over. Um, appreciate everybody joining today. I know we're probably going to have a couple of folks joining a little bit later as well, but I think it'd be good just to get started. Um, and with that being said, I want to introduce Melinda Wagner, who's going to be the moderator for today's event. Um, for those of you that have been involved in some of the prep and setup and outreach, uh, Melinda and Jerry basically put together this whole event, topics and, and, and efforts. So I want to thank her for kind of aligning all this together and, and, and bringing us all here on the topic. Um, and Melinda, just a little bit of background on Melinda. She's our healthcare practice leader at Technosis where her focus is to lead a diverse group of industry experts that allow technology to better enable patient experience and impact. Um, and what's unique about Melinda's background is that she's able to do that because she began working as a nurse, the bedside and labor delivery, cardiac and rehab and post anesthesia. Uh, she has a passion for medicine. She was a COO at a large physician owned healthcare organization and um, later was at Cerner for several years. Um, and she's held leadership roles in health systems, including Boston Children's Hospital, Emory Healthcare, Moffitt Cancer Center Research Institute. And now she currently leads, uh, leads our group here at Technosis. And with that being said, Melinda, I wanna hand it over to you and you can kick us off. Great, thank you very much, Kevin, and welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us for the ILF Healthcare Forum. I'm honored to moderate today's panel of exceptional leaders. Just a few housekeeping items. Today's event is going to be about 90 minutes. We'll spend a little over an hour discussing the topics and then open up the last 15 minutes for questions. But please don't feel like you have to wait till the last 15 minutes. You can submit your questions in the chat and we'll keep track of them there as well. Um, without further ado, I would like to introduce our, our panel. We have some amazing people today. Uh, first off is Doug Albro. 
Doug has invested over 20 years leading healthcare IT. He's recently joined um, Samaritan Health Services as a Vice President of Information Systems. Doug focuses on building, managing, supporting um, world-class systems and engaging patients in meaningful ways. He's an expert in Medicare and Medicaid requirements, having consulted many organizations, including Blue Cross Blue Shield. Doug has a passion for continual learning as an, and is an adjunct professor at ITT Technology Institute. Thank you so much, Doug, for joining us today. Thank you. Next, we have Dr. Uh, Bill Feaster. Dr. Feaster has spent over 40 years at the intersection of health and IT. He spent the last 10 years with Children's of Orange County, currently serving as the Vice President and Chief Health Information Officer. In addition to his pediatric practice, he has served in senior leadership roles in Sutter Health, Community Medical Centers, and Lucille Packard Children's Hospital. He's board certified in pediatrics, anesthesia, and clinical informatics. Um, Dr. Feaster is, was also a clinical professor at Stanford University School of Medicine and is currently a scientist advising the University of Rochester Georgian Institute for Data Sciences. Thank you so much, Dr. Feaster, for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Um, next, I'm very excited for Dr. Lubitz to join us from Florida, where he and his team are attending the award ceremony for the 2022 Edison Innovation Award as a finalist. Congratulations, Dr. Lubitz. Thank you. Dr. Lubitz is a leading healthcare expert and innovator with over 30 years focused on leadership and strategy, operations, research, clinical integration, pop health, and quality improvement across many different uh, health settings. He is an expert at implementing startup programs and complex turnarounds. He's held senior leadership roles at Ascension, St. Vincent's, and Wellstar. Currently, Dr. Lubitz is the chief medical officer for 30E Scientific and a principal at Progressive Healthcare, Inc. Thank you. Good to be here. Next, we have Jerry Pavia. Jerry is the healthcare senior client partner at Technosis and my partner in crime. She's also the immediate past president for Southern Cal Hymns. Jerry has over 17 years of healthcare consulting experience where she builds enduring partnerships and drives outcome focused initiatives. Jerry has a lifelong passion for advocacy and is currently chairing the first ever Southern California Safe, Health, Safe House Project Golf Classic. Safe House Project brings hope, freedom, and a future for trafficking survivors. And I know Jerry will make that an amazing event. Thank, Thank you, you, Jerry, for joining us. Yeah. Thank you so much. Next, we have Mike Seagraves. Mike started his healthcare career nearly 25 years ago as an occupational therapist and then moved into the informatics division during the EHR implementation. He was ultimately instrumental in leading digital transformation and strategy at, Dig at Dignity Health. Mike also served as the vice president of digital transformation at Kaiser Permanente and more recently joined Philips to build their digital transformation consulting practice. Mike is an exceptional leader guiding health systems through the organizational changes required to deliver purpose-focused digital value to members, providers, business leaders, and the communities. Thank you, Mike. Thanks, Melinda. And last but certainly not least, we have Eden, Ian Slade. Ian began his healthcare journey as a nurse at St. Jude's. In the past 20 years, Ian has served as HIT consultant in more than 30 hospitals in the US, Canada, and the UK. And I happen to know he also recently returned from Dubai. Ian has helped unite the Northern and Southern California advocacy groups, coordinating ag advocacy efforts for patients, healthcare technology, and hospitals in the halls of Sacramento, as well as the corridors of Capitol Hill. He is the founder of both IT Consulting Group and HPMA. Ian is an amazing leader and was recently awarded the HIMSS Global Advocacy Award for 2022. He is the national chair for HIMSS Advocacy Task Force and sits on the board for HIMSS of Southern Cal. Thank you jo for joining, Ian. Thank you. Thanks for the invite. So without further ado, we'll get into our topics today. I think we'll have some very uh, riveting discussion and we'll certainly, again, look forward to your all's questions as well. So the first topic is consumerization of healthcare. Um, broadly, consumerization of healthcare means individuals asserting control over directing their health and wellness. Recently, I was at a conference and heard a CEO comment that making similar care available to everyone is not equity. We have to meet each person where they are. 
So Mike, why don't you kick us off and help us understand what are the most important factors to addressing health equity by design and ensuring consumerization doesn't leave behind the most vulnerable? Mm, that is a great question. Um, and the first thing I want to say is that it's really a privilege to be in the company of this panel. Uh, I, I hope that I can offer something along with my colleagues here. Um, I'm glad you led with this question around equity um, because it is one of the um, representative examples of how digital technology and data um, can transform uh, healthcare and, 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 and the world if we would just do it. And when I uh, think about what, I think you asked what's the most important factors to, to, uh, to drive that, I would begin by saying we have to purposefully solve that problem. We have to ask the right questions. And this is a, 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 that statement is true more broadly as well in terms of at the intersection of technology and healthcare, we, we have a, a cultural norm in this industry of just getting really smart people in the room who know what they want and really smart people in the room who know how to build stuff and then asking them to sort it out. And then you build a whole bunch of stuff that somebody wanted, but it didn't actually serve the purpose that you aspired to. And, and, the, and the more advanced organizations have begun to really focus on experience, you might say, and, and even the more advanced are saying operations and experience and, and, and patient experience and provider experience. And we're starting to talk quadruple aim and we're getting there. But lost in that sometimes, I would argue most of the time, is an opportunity to ask a question like this. What is the best way we can leverage data, digital technology, all of our capabilities to close the equity gap in healthcare in this country? If we would ask that question and, and apply the same motivation that we applied to, to the rest of digital transformation in healthcare and, and, and solve those challenges in that lane, I think we would, we would see more progress than we have. Those are great points, Mike, thank you. Dr. Feaster, do you have some thoughts on this topic? Yeah, I think one of the biggest issues that we're trying to solve is access. And access to healthcare by everybody, not just those that can pay, not just those who we can communicate to, uh, not just those that happen to contact us, but can we reach out and touch everyone? And I think, uh, the digital enablement of the population has been driven fairly significantly by cell phones. And uh, it's about the only technology that's out there that is pretty universally available to our patient population, certainly, uh, including even some of our uh, younger patients, um, you know, in pediatrics or adolescent patients. So um, it gives us the opportunity to reach them that if we were just relying on a website on a computer or someone having uh, good internet access, uh, it gives us that opportunity to develop tools that leverage um, you know, cell phone technologies. So I'm, uh, I'm excited that we're gonna make some progress in that area over the next few years. Probably have done way too little prior to this, but um, I hope we can accelerate our pace. I'm ever amazed at the little babies that can use cell phones and <laughs> better than I can. So you're absolutely right. Dr. Yeah. Lewitz, how are you advising organizations on their strategies to address health equity? I think that uh, both uh, comments are just spot on. Um, access, affordable, cultural, competent healthcare uh, is, is tantamount, regardless of race, ethnicity, age, uh, gender identity, sexual orientation, all, all those various elements that make us the, the fabric that we are. And the challenge is that we in healthcare do a pretty poor job of this. We don't train nurses and, and physicians to be particularly culturally aware and culturally competent. We're better now than we were before. Um, there really is, to Mike's earlier point, nothing that enables that for us. I'll give you an example. A Somalian woman who presents for pregnancy care in Wisconsin is radically different in her needs, her communication, her awareness. Uh, it's a male-dominated society. She's not going to make decisions. 
but if physicians don't know that, uh, and, and most physicians for pregnant women are gonna be trying to talk to the patient, not to the husband who's making the decisions. It's a very different experience. So if we can enable clinicians um, to recognize that there are these subclads around the country. Uh, in addition, uh, we have low health literacy uh, to, to complicate that further. And we have communication gaps. The way I communicate being a Midwesterner is different than someone in rural Arkansas. So each one of these things has to be considered as you put together a strategy around approaching your patients, improving that patient experience, and ultimately improving their individual outcomes and the value proposition they receive from healthcare. Absolutely. Melinda, can I jump in with, with one more point that-, that Absolutely. Uh, spurred in me. And there's, there's a, a bit of a sad irony in this observation, but I, I think it's worth sharing that the, the, the similar types of sort of institutionalized ways of being in our country that have caused the equity gap in the first place, um, th there's an analog for that in the healthcare industry. We've institutionalized ways of working in the healthcare industry, both to Bob's point that, 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 that keep, uh, keep us from um, being more uh, culturally aware and sensitive and effective and, and all of that, and also that prevent us from asking the questions that we need to ask in order to solve the problem. Uh, and this is, this is a, a broader point that I think permeates our entire discussion, that when we talk about transforming healthcare with data, when we talk about digital transformation, it really is organizational transformation. It is cultural transformation, the systemic transformation. It is deconstructing the institutionalized ways of being and working across a number of lanes uh, and putting them back together in ways that, that not only solve for the, the aspirations we have from a healthcare perspective, but can solve, if we'll ask the right questions for some of these bigger opportunities uh, in front of us. And so it's a, it's a deep and meaningful um, task for us to approach this conversation and to not reduce it to um, technology and innovation, but to really talk about what it needs to be. Thank you, Mike, that's, that's great. Um, Ian, um, you've also been doing a lot of advocacy work um, across a, a whole bunch of different systems. How are you seeing health equity play out? Yeah, I actually have uh, a little bit of good news. Um, so Jerry and I have actually been um, advocating for this uh, here locally in Sacramento. And I'm happy to report that uh, as of last year, the governor actually signed um, $6 billion in funding uh, for broadband. And what this will do, it will allow 98% uh, of, of Californians to have access to broadband, which will then you know, allow for telemedicine. And, and not only that, um, broadband will allow for uh, in, increased reach in terms of education and everything else that is, is pretty much uh, online right now. So um, that took a lot of hard work, as you guys mm -hmm. know, you know, every session, if it doesn't get approved, you have to start all over again and work with different assembly members, but um, we were able to get it through last year. So that's one step, right? <laughs> is, is, is making it available, having the funding for it. But I, I couldn't agree more with what folks have said, especially what Mike has underlined, is that we, we can't just bolt equity on. We have to revisit things from, from the foundation and, and build it up so that we take away the, the natural biases that we have as human beings um, that is you know, part parcel of how we do things. And, and until we deconstruct, as Mike mentioned, and put it back together with equity in mind, we won't get there. This is not uh, a final coating of paint that we can put on uh, and, and hope that it works. Yeah, that's, that's a great comment and congratulations on the, on the bill. Um, I, I think it's part of the reimagining, and this is a great time for us to do that coming out of COVID when there's so much awareness about uh, the inequities um, that we saw during COVID. So I'm going to switch just a little bit on our topic, still consumerization, but Doug, can you share with us a little bit about how the payers are viewing consumerization of healthcare and, and, and ensuring health equity at the same time? Sure, would love to. You know, the... The, the reality is it's not just healthcare. And, and you know, so I, I, 
I worked with a lot of government plans. Um, I, I work for a CCO right now, a community care organization. And the, the, the reality is healthcare is a component of it, but housing is a component of it sometimes too. Um, mental health is a component of it sometimes. And the, the, the overall ecosystem is oftentimes bigger and more complex and um, working those handoffs correctly oftentimes are, are, are critical. Um, and unfortunately, because of our history, the, the, the population that you know, we're really kind of speaking of have probably had negative encounters already. So they've gone to a hospital and have been sent home because you really should have gone to a urgent care or there, there's just a lot of pent up kind of, I don't trust the system already, or they know someone that doesn't trust the system already. So part of the, the, the overall approach as every part of the, the organization, you know, from a health plan standpoint, we use, you know, we support a lot of the, uh, the, the Medicaid population. And, you know, how do you make sure that they understand what a pre-op even is? You know, I, I need a, I need a pre-op. I don't technically know that I have a plan. Um, so it, it, it's all around the communication and what has to happen for them to kind of engage in the healthcare system. And at times it really feels like the game is rigged against them. Um, and it's up to us in really solving that. How do you walk someone through? I love the example of, you know, the, the Somalian woman. That's a completely different experience. If you have been... Um, to a, an emergency room two or three times and were kicked out because they didn't want to triage you, you're probably not going to go back to the hospital, regardless of how much care you need. And then when you stop and you think about from a health plan standpoint, I mean, and let's be honest, health plans get beat up a lot and sometimes it's <laughs> deserving. Um, but if you just look at it from a health plan perspective, if I can get a hold of a diabetic, and help them control their sugar, then I can avoid a lot of costs. If I can have a heart failure patient take a diuretic as opposed to having a heart attack, and I know that's an oversimplification, from a health plan perspective, that makes a lot of sense, especially from a community care organization supporting a state Medicaid. Um, but how do you get to them? How do you, and the, the answer was already said, it is amazing. It doesn't matter what social economic state you're in, everybody has a phone. And one of the things that I know that we're doing to try to help solve this is how do you start with this in first? Because that is how they interact. That's how you're going to get them a ride to the uh, clinic so that they can have preventative care. That's how you're going to hand them off to a whatever the other organizations that they need to be a part of. But from a, of a plan perspective, it, it's all about how do you engage a population that already doesn't like you, that already feels that the game's rigged against them. And it's a, it's a hard nut to crack. Um, and it, it takes that outreach. It takes touching people where they're at in a way that is compassionate, not procedural. You know, you didn't follow the right steps, so you're punished. Um, we got to get out of that mode. I, I appreciate that a lot. I think that um, it's exciting to hear so many different facets of healthcare talk about how to make sure that care is available to the most vulnerable and consumerization seems to be really help um, pivoting that conversation even further. Before we leave this topic of consumerization, I have one more question for, for the panel. Looking back at the EHR era, we learned so much about digitizing existing and often convoluted processes, and that was not necessarily the best approach. And we're sort of still living with some of those, those choices. 
So um, what are the most important lessons learned from the EHR era that can be applied to the consumer's digital journey today? Basically, I know that we can do better out of the gate for the consumers than we did for our clinicians um, and uh, would like to hear your thoughts on that. Jerry, I know you were heavily involved in EHR implementations. How are you advising your clients as they pursue their journey with the consumers? Um, thank you, Melinda. So I think one of the lessons learned for, for all of us in, is that more data is not necessarily better data. It is, if it is not the right data at the right time. And during the digital journey, we recommend, you know, we do not, we're not to overload the consumer with data that's not personalized to their needs. And I think another lesson that I've actually pulled away is that um, one of the problems we've seen with, within the EHR is the lack of data integrity. For example, through multiple conversations that I've had in the past and over the last few years, there was an initial influx of data being pushed into the EHR without any correlation to you know, the correct clinical record. And so one of the recommendations that, um, that I've been engaged in and having while I'm advising clients is that before you begin down your digital path, there is a strong need to validate and consider the data integrity before it reaches the consumer for real-time viewing, which is what we're gonna be seeing. And um, an ongoing training for those with access to the HR about what to place in the HR. This is a necessary ongoing process to ensure the data integrity and correct data is attached to the correct clinical record. Elevating the mounds of unstructured data immersed into the HR and um, in addition to that, um, I think another you know, takeaway for me has been, um, we really were incompetent at mastering the patient, computer, and the provider in that nice little triangle. So the EHR has often been viewed um, as an obstacle to the patient relationship. In um, this new consumer digital era, we now have the opportunity to use the tools to build that relationship you know, for you know, um, offering training, training the provider to talk to their patients on how to use the portal to interact with them more efficiently. Um, those are some insights that I think, as I think about this topic as a pull away. Great, thanks, Jerry. Now, Mike, I know you um, helped uh, implement one of the first EMRs at Dignity Health. Uh, what are your thoughts on this topic? Well, we, we learned a lot. Um, I don't know that we've implemented a lot of what we learned, but a couple of things come to mind that I think might be useful here. Uh, one of them is around the importance that we touched on earlier of asking the right question when you design anything at the intersection of technology and healthcare. That, um, uh, you know, when you ask people what they want, they're gonna tell you. And if you got people that can build it, who are getting paid for it, they'll build it. And at the end of the day, you, you haven't asked what is it we're trying to achieve. And so knowing what we're trying to achieve and being uh, flexible enough in that question to, to not be binary about it, to not be uh, you know, selective, I guess. It's really about how can we solve the many competing priorities that we have in the right permutation for our organization and our community that we serve. And if we can ask those right questions, we'll get better answers if we apply uh, you know, better design thinking to it. Um, but then it, it also comes to our ways of working in, in healthcare. Um, and I mean, both sort of structured and, and process wise. So we spent decades and billions of dollars in, in the EHR world, locking data away for privacy and security mm -hmm. and to power fee for service models of business. And now we're on in a place where we need to liquidate all that data. And we don't even know whose it is when you get it out of the system. And so we've got to figure, we've got to figure out how to, how to solve that problem. And, and I think we're not going to rip and replace all of those billions of dollars of work. And so technology is going to help us uh, rationalize that and, and, and help us navigate forward from there. And, and the last point I'll make, because uh, there, there are many, but the last one that I think is, is deeply relevant is that it's not enough to be really good at solving a particular problem with technology today we have to create organizations that are capable of continuously innovating because healthcare and technology are not standing still. Mm -hmm. And so it, 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 the, the analogy I often, I often think about and talk about 
uh, is is Netflix blockbuster, right? If it, just to make it simple for for not for you folks, but for folks in general, um, that that you know both those organizations applied technology. Just blockbuster was solving the problem of making it easier for you to come rent something. And and Netflix when they first started was like, hey, we had a better idea. We're going to mail DVDs to people. And they could, they could never have imagined, Netflix could never have imagined when they started mailing DVDs to people with this cool new way of, of, of looking at the world, that one day you and I and everybody else would be streaming content that they created to our phones on an airplane somewhere around the world. They had no idea. And they didn't get really good at, at, at that by being the best DVD mailing organization on the planet. Mm -hmm. the, the, they had to be good. It's, it is a simultaneous journey of being and becoming. Mm -hmm. that we have to embrace and and you can be uh how you need to be today in a way that is on the path to what you aspire to become and you can be what you need to be today in a way that is not on the path that you aspire to become so having that clarity of um the the the, <laughs> the need for innovation and to put your organization together in a way that solves today's problems while while creating a capability inside that organization to continuously innovate for me is one of the deepest lessons learned out at EHR where we spent billions of dollars and boxed ourselves into a corner and now we're trying to find our way out. Yeah, I completely agree. So many of the clients I've dealt with um, see it as a beginning and an end state as opposed to a continuous journey um, and committed to that, to that journey. So Dr. Feaster, I know you also have been engaged in the implementation of the EHRs for many years. Um, what are your thoughts? Yeah, well, Jerry and Mike already made great points. <clears throat> I, you know, healthcare is complex. There, there's no question about that. And yes. we tended, as we developed EMRs, we tended to build that complexity into the EMR to match the complexity of healthcare. So we made them almost impossible to use uh, and adapt to workflow. And people currently uh, using EMRs struggle with usability. So take that and think about the patient. If we build the same uh, healthcare for them is complex too, but we can't build complexity into the way they interact with us or they'll just, they won't do it. Our doctors and nurses, uh, they have to do it. They struggle with it, but they have to do it, but the patient doesn't. And if we really want to extend convenience, access services to the patient, it's got to be done in a way that, it, you know, it's like, what they do with everything else. It has to be consistent with their experiences accessing shopping or doing uh, or gaming or other things that they do with their tools. Uh, it can't be the way we think it should be done in the EMR. So that, I guess that um, would be my, uh, you know, requirement for us as we move forward. Don't duplicate the mistakes we made mm -hmm. building complexity into our tools that we give people to use. Um, Linda, could I skip uh -huh. a question? Sure. You know, um, one thing I'm sort of picking up on through all the questions so far is that it feels to me as a healthcare outsider that the incentives don't seem to be aligned properly. Is that a fair statement? And is there anything you can do about it? I have an anecdote, Melinda, if I could. Yeah, absolutely. So, <laughs> I'm nothing if not anecdotes. Um, so I was, <laughs> I was in Orlando um, talking to a bunch of uh, clinical data scientists. And um, one of the data scientists was, was from Canada. She was the chief data scientist there. And uh, after the, the, the talk, she came up to me and said, hey, Ian, I noticed something. I noticed that the charting that it requires for, let's just say, cardiologists in the U.S. is easily five to six times more than the cardiologist in Canada. And she said, what are your thoughts on that? I'm like, I don't know. You have to ask the insurance company. Uh, and <laughs> you didn't get the humor uh, because, you know, for them, it's, it's single payer. But, but yes, I 100% agree, Alan. Uh, that when we were building a, a lot of these things, uh, 
in the back end, we're constantly looking at, you know, what is the before of the ICD-9 as ICD-10 codes, what is the CPT codes, what, what are the drop downs that match um, with your back end revenue cycle and trying to capture all of that. Uh, also your, your risk of mortality, uh, severity of illness and all of that. But when you ask the, a clinician that is working on the unit, hey, what is it that you really need for a stroke patient or a heart attack patient? And you'd be surprised what they need is this much, what they're capturing is this much. So, so there's definitely that disconnect um, uh, in terms of what the clinician needs uh, at, at the bedside and also what we need to, to run the business because, uh, well, we're, we're not like Canada. So that's just um, something I want to add. Thank you. And so Alan, just as the health plan representative on this, I wanted to, to kind of jump in and answer your question directly. The alignment is not there. The bottom line, there is a billions and potentially trillions of dollars being circulated around and the, the alignment around the patient is not there. Mm -hmm. And I think that your, your point is spot on to one of the root problems, which is as a health plan, I'm trying to control costs so I can keep the premiums down because they're outrageous already. And that is a barrier for entry. But the reality is we don't know we have too many, I am a IT technologist, CIO, CTO, been doing it for a long time. We, we come up with extra rules that then the clinicians have to do, which takes more time from them. And they, it, the, the bottom line is the only person that suffers the most or the person who suffers the most is the patient. And that's why we have, I'm on discussions like this. I think that's why the, 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 the people that are on the panel are on the panel is because it isn't lined correctly. And the, the hope is we can, instead of doing the iterative jump where we get a little bit better, we get a little better. Mike alluded to that. How do we leapfrog, learn from other industries, but how do we leapfrog to get it right? And I think the reality is we might have to do it over as opposed to, I don't think we can iterate our way into success. Mm -hmm. I think it has to be a maybe do over or at least uh, more than 50% do over. Mm -hmm. And I'll shut up and take my uh, lick from <laughs> the people that don't agree with me. <laughs> Thank you, Doug. That's a daunting thought, but you may be, be actually right. Um, I'm so certain that the patient's engagement will help guide us in a lot of ways as to uh, how we get there. Any other thoughts from the panel uh, before we move to our next topic um, on closing on consumerization? I just, okay. yeah. I'm gonna play off Ian and give an anecdote. When I first started in practice uh, in uh, Appalachian, Tennessee, I kept my patient notes on a three by five card. Yeah. Wow. And that was fine. <laughs> and then we invested in, in the Lawrence Weed Soap Note System, which yeah. is actually a paper chart, right? Mm -hmm. uh, right. Okay. And then uh, went on to Indiana University to learn all about uh, electronic medical records from Regan Streif Institute. And the promise was that this was going to make clinical decision support better. And what happened was that it was twisted into improving um, billing information. And so the, the promise of clinical decision support has not been realized because of the poor relevance of data and the acceptability of the current tools. So if we want to address anything, I completely agree with Doug. I would love it if we could do a, a do-over. But if we can't, at least try to improve the relevance of data, solicit feedback from the end user, the, both the patient and the physician, to, to create some customization and get measures that are meaningful to both of us. Uh, in the care of the patient. I, I think it really is ultimately about the, the liquidation of and the, and the utilization of that data that we've spent all these years locking away and, and fragmenting and, and misaligning. And um, 
I'd love to see a do-over from a, a architectural perspective. I, I, I don't think that's tenable. We might probably make more, more progress with policy on the payer side than we will on, on the technology side by ripping and replacing all those systems. But I am optimistic that, that there are ways in which we can harmonize the data from where it sits, um, identify that data, make it accessible through plug and play, you know, type integration instead of spaghetti factories we have today uh, and empower the type of experiences that we aspire to. But even if we get really good at that, and even if we get really good at asking the right questions when we have that engine underneath it that can deliver on it, if we don't address the misaligned incentives, we won't be solving the same problem. Mm -hmm. and, and that's where I think the, these things come together was the point I wanted to make, you know, that, that, that they, are, they are related. Um, and they're related even within health systems. You know, Dignity Health, we have a, a wide mix of commercial and, and uh, capitated payer types. And we had a digital revolution there. We built this incredibly experience focused solution and it was great. And we made the, 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 the experience of getting to, into our ERs really frictionless. And in the cities, our hospital presidents loved us. And in the valley where everybody was on an at-risk capitated model, they're like, you're killing me. You're gonna cost me my job because you're, I need to keep these people home and healthy. We, ha we have to solve those incentives along with the, the technology, along with the process so that we are solving the same important problems. I think that's absolutely true. And as consumers are paying more of the, the first dollar, um, I think their expectations are gonna help drive some of those changes um, with those digital tools and the ability to remain at home um, more often in better places, having more monitoring tools. Um, I'm hopeful that we won't have to do a complete do-over, but that we can evolve with the patient truly in the center this time. Yeah, and I just want to clarify, when I said a, a do-over, I'm speaking of the, the financial incentives. Gotcha. Um, the, the, the fact that the plans are, in uh, capitation is a great example. The financial model around capitation is don't go, don't be a consumer. You know, yeah. You're incented to keep people home. And that's not in the long-term health interest of the patient. It's probably not in the financial benefit of the health plan. But right now, those, those incentives are really out of alignment. And I think it's going to take somebody forcing that issue, um, not necessarily blowing up an entire healthcare system. So I just wanted to clarify. Thank you, Doug. So our next topic is about how do we progress on this digital journey um, quickly, but also safely. Um, there's been almost $60 billion word worldwide, according to CB Insights, invested in digital health startups. And that's a 79% increase just from the previous year. With all that new digital technology coming out, how do you guys mar um, uh, navigate and advise um, on this market to your clients making decisions about whether to invest or build or buy digital technology? Dr. Lubitz, I know you've been on all of those different facets of building and buying and investing. Um, what are your thoughts on this? How do you advise your clients? Well, um, obviously, as we mentioned earlier, healthcare follows payment and uh, the payment for some digital technology is good. Some of it's temporary. Let's take tele telehealth as an example. Uh, telemedicine is currently paid for by Medicare. Um, on a per use basis. And we've seen a 63% increase in telehealth utilization as a result of that. But, but uh, telehealth is not uh, the, the panacea. It's for specific uses and specific patient populations. Um, it's typically specific for remote monitoring, for uh, chronic conditions, psychiatric conditions, things like that. Um, and, and frankly, uh, a, a recent uh, study that came out of Harvard from the TH Chan School of Public Health showed that more than two thirds of, of patients want a personal visit. They want that personal touch. So what we wanna find is technology that enables that relationship. Um, let's take wearables as an example of enabling. Wearables collect enormous amounts of data. And I guess for this audience, you need to know that we as practicing clinicians get overwhelmed by that amount of data. So what happens is it creates anxiety in the patient because they come with their blood sugar, they come with their blood pressure, uh, they come with their heart rate, and they have 
400 data points in the last two hours. And they say, please help me understand why my blood pressure was 130 over 60 here and 180 over 110 here. And we just don't have the systems to simplify that. So I think from an investment standpoint, invest in the things that simplify and make relevant our work. Um, we'll go back to, to um, dissatisfaction among our staff. The current electronic record system creates enormous dissatisfaction among nurses and physicians. And it is one of the key drivers in um, uh, physicians and nurses leaving the, the field. Um, we know that some technology actually flips that around, enables that robots, for example. Robots in uh, nursing fields can actually replace some of the menial tasks that nurses seem to do. So I think you have to weigh out that value proposition of the ease of implementation, the relevance to the end user, the value it brings, and uh, does it help to, you to retain and improve your staff uh, satisfaction? And then that drives the patient satisfaction. Great, thank you. Dr. Feaster, are you handling that any different in the pediatric realm? Well, you know, we um, certainly have our issues with usability and burnout and everything. And one of the things that we're focusing on is try to make things easier to use, but it's kind of like putting lipstick on a pig uh, a bit. Uh, so um, just making existing technology. So you know, I, I think our focus now is more, you know, there's only so much we can do. We're doing everything we can. Um, we are applying data science and predictive analytics to try to help people, uh, you know, use data better within their AMR, but that's a long process, a lot of stuff to do. But, you know, I wanted to kind of make the point about so how quickly we are able, though, for certain things to pivot. Now, healthcare is kind of a, you know, you think of healthcare as kind of this big uh, moving force that, you know, so complex, never changes other than it moves forward slowly. Think about COVID and our response to COVID. And if you, if you use that as an example of how we could pivot to improve patient experience, for example, um, we went from no COVID patients to being overwhelmed with COVID patients uh, in healthcare. We went from all person, you know, like uh, Bob was mentioning, we went from all in-person visits to uh, virtual visits overnight. Um, and uh, the government helped us do that through paying for them. Uh, we went from... Uh, you know, not giving a COVID vaccine to setting up quickly COVID clinics and setting up technology to help uh, run those. So we are, we are capable of, of doing things in innovative, quick, and efficient ways, except we don't show it very often, which is, it's too bad. COVID was a great example of everybody kicking in together and making things quickly evolve. But we, you know, that's uh, the exception rather than the rule in healthcare, unfortunately. Uh, and there isn't, a, you know, that was a burning platform. The current platform just is smoldering. It's not burning. It's unfortunate we can't stay focused on the common em enemy. And in the case of COVID, where we did, everybody came together with the same focus and different views of it, but, but certainly all trying to tackle the same problems. And a lot, of, a lot of collaboration went on, I think, through the COVID time period. Other thoughts about the digital health uh, technology market and how to, how to navigate that from the rest of the panel? I, I'd add uh, to a couple of thoughts. Uh, one is on, on the question of how we advise uh, constituents uh, to build, buy, borrow, whatever. Um, <laughs> I think it's more about knowing yourself as an organization, what the right answer is for you. I, you know, it's not, I think, I think we can achieve the same end uh, in, in a variety of ways. 
what I think is concurrently important, and you can probably start to, I probably start to sound a bit like a broken record, but <laughs> is, is understanding the importance of changing our traditional ways of doing anything in healthcare. What, what got us here will not get us there. Uh, traditional ways of funding, traditional ways of project managing, traditional ways of measuring success, in my view, are inadequate for, but I don't think it's just my view. I think, I think the evidence suggests uh, th that this is, they are inadequate for where we need to go. And I don't wanna oversimplify it, but in really broad strokes, we need to build a way of working inside at least a part of healthcare. I get it, we still need to build hospitals and data centers and that kind of thing. But for this part we're talking about, we need to build a capability where we um, have clarity of the problems that are most important, where we have funding that's aligned to those problems, where we build empowered teams whose job it is to align to those problems and persistently address them with clear measures of success. And they are empowered to, to pivot through those cycles of data-driven iteration until they achieve those outcomes. And if building it didn't work, then build it differently. And if buying didn't work, buy something, but at least you know what you're, what you're aspiring to do. And we just, and, and I wanna make this, this, this related point. Well, all this stuff I'm talking about here, like we're not making up, like this is a solved problem in other industries. So like we kind of have the, the key <laughs> to, to the test. <laughs> And it's really back to my broken record point. It is, it is a matter of organizational and cultural transformation, institutional transformation inside the industry. Um, and it can be done, I believe. Melinda, if I could add. Um, my, my general mantra when advising uh, organizations is just because you can doesn't mean you should. And I've seen organizations have three laboratory LIS systems, right? Yeah. <laughs> Just because one system can do a little bit for pathology and another can do a little bit here. So um, complexity is easy uh, to, to uh, fold into what Dr. Future said. But simplicity is really hard because it forces mm -hmm. you to confront the fact that um, just adding something on top, bolting in, it's easy, but um, I, I don't know about you guys, but every organization that I've been in and I ask, hey, can I get a list of all the systems that you currently have? And, and I'm looked at as if I have a third eye, which some say I do, but um, it, it, it's, hard to, it's hard to just get that. No one's just, oh, Ian, well, that's an easy one. Boom, here's a list of the 578 systems that we have categorized by uh, this is what it does. This is, you know, no, no. Just a simple question of what communication tools are you using? Any organization, very small, they have Slack, they have Teams, they have Zoom, they have this. <laughs> like this one, one area. Now try <laughs> extrapolating that. So just because you can doesn't mean you should. And and taking the discipline of taking an inventory, kind of. You know, the same principle with the household. Before you go to Costco, you take a look at your refrigerator. What do I have? So I don't end up with 10 pounds of bananas when I come home. Um, but we don't, it's funny, we don't do that in healthcare. Like, mm -hmm. oh, Dr. So-and-so requested this or someone requested that. We need to get it in right away. Well, yeah. well we got six, six of those already in here. Well, this one does something a little better. Um, does it? Do we need it? So, so, so having the discipline to slow down and, and really take stock of what you have, what is it that you need and, and tying it to what Mike said, to what you're trying to accomplish. So what is it you're trying to become and how does this fit into that instead of just doing the quick fix of just getting it and installing, which we're good by the way. Yeah, I, I love that. At Technosis, we talk a lot about going slow to go fast and really understanding your foundation before you start uh, piling on. I was talking once to a cardiologist and he was showing me how he had created his own IT system, uh, shadow system out of the uh, corporate IT uh, system. And, uh, and then he had to acknowledge to me, but now Melinda, I don't know how to manage this. I've created this Frankenstein mm -hmm. monster that does or did exactly what I wanted yesterday, but I don't know how to manage it. Um, so I think you're absolutely right about discipline. 
Um, I'm going to move us to the next topic. Um, so for the first time in 17 years, labor shortage is the top problem for health systems across the country and actually around the globe. Um, other industries have uh, learned how to re-engineer roles using technology. For example, in the banking industry, the bank teller role silently disappeared, not the people, but the role. So how are you advising the organizations different, to think differently about the use of technology, but equally important, evolving the traditional roles so that they can navigate uh, the labor shortage because it's, it's certainly not going away anytime soon. Doc, Dr. Lubitsch, you wanna start that one? Sure, I'd be happy to. You, you know, um, there is a significant nursing shortage in the United States. Let's just start there. And the growing lack of nurses impacts the existing nurses' well-being and the patient outcomes and the hospital's bottom line. Hospitals lost three and a half percent on average across the country last year. So they're not flush with cash to hire more nurses. Uh, further, um, there aren't more nursing schools. That's the rate limiting step at training more nurses for uh, inpatient and outpatient settings. So we need to look at ways to extend our nurses' lifespan as well as take some burden off of them. In part, we want all of our healthcare workers to work to the top of their license. So nurses who are doing uh, tasks that can be done by a medical assistant should be done by a medical assistant. So there is some process evolution, retraining, um, and uh, uh, improvements in assignment that need to occur in healthcare. But there are also some opportunities for technology to enable um, this further. For example, um, having staff collect data from a patient when data can be entered in a, um, a patient portal. Um, that's that's a, a simple but very effective uh, answer for that. Um, uh, ways that we can uh, extend uh, nurses through uh, other technology, like um, um, Era Health has a product uh, that um, monitors patients for early signs of sepsis. So instead of the nurse having to continually monitor the patient and wait for the shoe to drop, so to speak, uh, you have a technological solution that's monitoring the data minute by minute, the patient's vital signs, their laboratory findings, pulls keyword search, natural language search out of physician notes and nurses notes, and then gives a score. And if that score breaks a certain plane, it notifies the nurse, hey, you need to get the doctor to come evaluate this patient for sepsis. So it's those sorts of tools, those um, uh, early warning systems uh, that I think might be the, the future of healthcare to extend our nursing staff and also at the same time, improve the quality and patient outcomes. Great, thank you. Dr. Feaster, any thoughts on this one? Well, one of the barriers to actually uh, providing extenders for nurses is the government, the state government that requires mandates uh, nursing ratios. We could probably unload a lot of their work, but we still need the same number of nurses that have a mandatory uh, number per patient, depending on the level of acuity. Yeah. So on you know, I wish we could do that. We are bringing in newer and newer nurses, nurses with less training right out of schools. Uh, but that's also putting a lot of stress, like you'd mentioned, Bob, on the more senior nurses, not only just absence of nurses, but uh, the fact that we have a bunch of newly untrained or unex inexperienced nurses. And then the cost of uh, nursing for uh, bringing in travelers and stuff has gone up just so hideously that, uh, yeah, I'm surprised the hospitals in the country have a 3% margin. Uh, we certainly didn't during COVID with all the impact on us. But in terms of leveraging, uh, you know, hopefully we could at least make their life better, make them happier by doing technological improvements in the way they work. Um, another thing though, is we're finding so many of our uh, workforce now are at home and they're gonna stay at home permanently. And how we, can we provide the technology for working in this hybrid environment that uh, enables home workers to work as efficiently as they are in the hospital, 
to let them meet with those that are in the hospital in an effective way. Um, and um, how do we, that's going to be the norm moving forward. So we've got to get used to it. But it also gives us some opportunities to shop for uh, employees in other states, uh, distant from the hospital. Um, if they're going to be working at home anyway, they don't have to be uh, in Orange County. They could be in Nevada. They want to move there because of the taxes and other things. So I, I think just this remote workforce We've got to figure out how to use better and better and have technology that enables them to work more and more efficiently as well as help us assess how efficient they are in their work. Great, thank you. Um, Ian, have you seen any uh, unique um, ways of addressing the unburdening of the nurse and or physicians or any other clinician uh, in your consulting? Not a lot in terms of uh, unburdening. One of the things that Dr. Pierce mentioned was, was the ratios. It's hard to, to deal with that. And um, uh, the, the working at the top of the license has always been you know, one of the goals they want to have. But if, if you're still bound to that ratio, especially in California, uh, it, it's still really hard. Now, um, looking at the, the statistics of, of um, the nursing shortage in our population, uh, Bureau of Labor and Statistics mentioned that by 2030, um, 27%, close to a third of our population will be more than 65 years of age. Let that one sink in. Yeah. That, <laughs> I'm not talking 2050, or 2030. And um, along with that, um, last year, 80,000 uh, qualified nursing students were sent away, 80,000, because we did not have um, the facility, the teachers who, to um, accommodate them. Um, estimates have shown that it's around 180,000 uh, nurses are needed net new every year. But yet by 2030, uh, we will be losing uh, a total of around a million nurses. And a huge part of it is, well, burnout, right? So uh, population, living longer, elderly being a big part of the population, nursing shortage uh, getting worse, and also the existing nurses uh, for a myriad of reasons are, are, are leaving um, the workplace and, and finding other things to do. And I, I think one of the things that's kind of sad is um, for the instructors, I actually had taught pharmacology one and two back in the day but I had to quit because it didn't pay much. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I was sad because I actually enjoyed teaching. Uh, but if you <laughs> pay for cost of daily living, it's quite mm -hmm. easier to pick up a shift. I was making more as a staff nurse than as a clinical instructor teaching future staff nurses. And mind you, the requirements to be a clinical instructor is way higher, but you're getting paid less than mm -hmm. pulling a shift in the ER. So, so, so the numbers don't add up. And, and unfortunately, you know, uh, 15 years since I left teaching, um, that trend hasn't gotten better. So I think there's a lot of just common sense stuff that we can do. Funding is a big part. Public policy is a big part. Also the H-1B, you know, there are a lot of nurses in other countries, Vietnam, India, Philippines, uh, trying to get in here, but we only have what, roughly 181,000. And that's for everyone. Everyone is trying to get in. Uh, so there's a myriad of things that we can do that doesn't require Elon Musk to get in the mix <laughs> and invent <laughs> something out of this world. Uh, we can do to help with this if we just had the will to do it and just sit down and say, okay, we're not gonna, we're not gonna get out of this guys. So just like COVID, let's tackle it together because if COVID has shown us anything that when we put our heads and hearts together, we can accomplish amazing things. Absolutely. I have a couple of thoughts to add there, Melinda, if that's okay. That'd be great, Mike. Yeah, if you have time. Um, on this question of how can technology help reduce the burden uh, on the workforce, I think of two broad categories, and we've, and we've touched on them, but I want to add a couple of examples I don't think I heard. Um, one of those categories is, is 
uh, getting people to the top of the license, re you know, reducing mean, uh, uh, menial work. And I think that, you know, top of license is kind of a clinical term. I think that applies to non-clinical people too, conceptually, you know, like front desk workers, whatever registrars, we can get them doing more meaningful work too. And ways we can do that, we, uh, I think Bob touched on robots. And, I, and I, what I heard, I, I think, was some of the physical robots, like Pixis machines that can go down the hall and deliver meds. There are also software robots. This is a, a big trend in the industry right now, robotic process automation. It's not that complicated to, to write software programs that, for example, can do pre-authorizations for radiology procedures or whatever that can kind of take some of that menial work of pulling stuff together. And, and I take the point people made that that's not always translated to, to cost savings from a, a staff reduction perspective, but very often it can be uh, uh, turned into cost savings from a staff retention perspective, and, mm -hmm. it, and it can be turned into uh, revenue from a less denials perspective in that particular example. So, so in RPA, robotic process automation, is another important uh, element. Uh, and then lastly, in this sort of category, just we've touched on it already, but just the better design of the EMR itself, like getting to a point where we liquidate the data and we have the pre predictive and prescriptive analytics that, that reduce the burden of having to find stuff buried in this mountain that we've created. Um, I think all of those are ways that if with intention, we can reduce the burden on the workforce. And then the one other thing I'd like to add that I think is a trend in the industry, it's related but a little different, is how we can help administrators in health systems make better operational decisions about how they run the business. Mm -hmm. And one of the technologies in that lane that's that's got a lot of momentum right now are digital twins. Um, so I think it's something like I read a stat like 87% of healthcare executives feel like digital twins are, are uh, uh, you know, on the rise and, and important to, to them. And this is just the notion of being able to de-risk your decision making about whether you should add nurses or reduce beds or add a clinic or not or whatever by having uh, really well written um, models that are you know, uh, representative of your, 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 your business. Um, and I think if we can empower leaders with that data to make better decisions about the environment the staff is in, that will help as well hmm. as the other parts of, of that we touched on a, a bit ago. Yeah. I completely yeah. agree. I think with that data, letting it roll down also to the, the associates themselves. So, you yeah. know, with good data, you can say, I want to do a short shift and here's where it's needed and I can take it. So, yeah. Um, I think you're absolutely right, really, really creating the structures where the data can help guide the business decisions, unemotional, but um, for the best outcome for, for the associates. Um, I think someone yeah. else was about to make a comment. Yeah, I, I just wanted to make one more on, you know, relevant to data is how can we leverage data to improve wellness? Uh, improve, reduce disease burden? You know, you'd mentioned, Ian, the number of, uh, senior citizens that are going to be burdening our health care. Well, they're not that much of a burden if they're healthy. Uh, if they haven't, if they've managed their chronic, everybody gets chronic disease uh, eventually, but if it's well managed and if people care for it properly, they don't end up in the hospital where we need those nurses to treat their congestive heart failure or whatever. So I think, um, you know, preventive health care, population health, uh, whatever you want to call it, um, is going to be critical for our future if we're ever, you know, and also just from a cost perspective with healthcare costs rising so much, um, the only way we're going to be able to afford it is to keep people healthier and not use the system. And as we move more and more to capitated or other types of reimbursement that put providers at risk, uh, we need to keep our patients uh, well cared for and healthy or we're going to lose our shirt. So uh, that's an area that I think will help with sh staff shortages, will help with financial problems and, uh, lots, of, and uh, lots of the things we've been talking about. <laughs> if I can build on that comment. Absolutely. In addition, if we use our big data to create predictive analytics, from a population perspective, we can then better um, move our resources and pair our resources to what to expect. For example, mm -hmm. 
in uh, Taiwan, the CDC Taiwan has a, an amazing system. Now they're in a different uh, common medical record across the whole country. So it's not as applicable here, but um, they actually can predict six weeks in advance to when their peak flu season is going to hit with enormous accuracy. So knowing that here in the US, we could realign resources for testing, for treatment, for immunization uh, and create uh, greater capacity when it's needed and then shrink that capacity when it's not needed. So I think predictive analytics to Bill's comment uh, is going to be critical uh, as our resources are very limited. So Doug, I'm guessing you would like to see um, in your industry, people focus more on the prevention and predictive side, but how is the labor shortage actually impacting uh, the payer side? Well, I, I think we have some of the same problems, you know, Fortunately, in the health plan side, the on-prem need for nurses and, and other workers are not the same. Um, so you can be a, uh, you can staff a nurse line from anywhere, um, sometimes not even in the, in the country. Yeah. Um, but, you know, one, one thing that I did want to, to, to point out, you know, part of this is about reimagining our processes. You know, whether it's the, you know, if, if, if I ever showed you a, a flow chart of what happens on a, a claim in the bizarre, I mean, it would be a Saturday night skit um, <laughs> from when a off comes in to a procedure to all the craziness that goes on with it. You know, I've got a, a, a diagram on a wall that is an entire conference room wall for just the claims process. But I can send $100 to my kid on my phone while I'm waiting in line at McDonald's. And, you know, it's been said on a number of occasions, a lot of industries have figured this out. Yeah. Why can't we do a pay immediate claim. Why, why does it have to be this complicated? Why do we have to use a technology like EDI that is a little dated? Um, you know, but I think that whether it's a nurse, whether it's an IT person, whether it's a, it, there, there's so much churn in healthcare. It really requires a lot of extra people. And I think that if we take a step back and we look at the processes and say, there's got to be a better way. We can cut some of that out. And whether it's coming from an EMR all the way into a payment directly, think of all the billing people that you could cut out of the equation, all the you know, uh, nurses that have to go back and do a third authorization because the first two got rejected because there's some weird thing that happened or they didn't fill something out just exactly perfect. You know, why can't that be an online, real-time thing? The technology is there, and it's there in other industries. We just have to do it in healthcare. And I think that the, that simplification will help with burnout across the entire ecosystem, um, not just in a, a technology perspective. Completely agree. Ian, in your advocacy on the Hill and such places, are you seeing any appetite for reimagining, truly reimagining? Um, those things, because so much of what we have to do from a claims perspective um, is, is really regulatory. Oh, 100%. Uh, uh, I, I, I talked to um, uh, Senator Feinstein's uh, chief of staff a lot, and you'd be surprised. Um, they, they actually want to solve this as much as we do, um, and, and they're looking to us for answers. And um, but what's funny sometimes is you get into conversations where in they ask for recommended verbiage in the bill. Uh, pretty much <laughs> short of saying, tell me, <laughs> tell me what it is that I need to put in here. Uh, you know, but you, they, you can't just copy paste, it has to be recommended language, things of that nature. But what I tell them is that uh, it's, it's not, it, it, the, the problem isn't really like, the desire. The problem is, okay, after we, pass the bills to allow this to happen. It, the devil is in the details. And, and how we figure out how to go from point A to point B 
and, and make sure that we're all aligned. We're, we're doing this in a standardized and synchronized fashion. That is the hard part. I mean, obviously we need the funding and everything. We need, uh, as I say, you know, public policy allows for, uh, for us to do things and also to fund things. But it is incumbent upon us to, again, sit down and say, okay, we need to solve this together. And until we have, like um, Doug was mentioning, uh, our, our incentives aligned, yeah. we're not going anywhere. <laughs> if if okay. one group wants people to come in, the other group wants people to stay at home, and, and people are getting paid differently, and we don't have the people to do the work, um, people in Capitol Hill and in Sacramento, they're, they're looking at me like, dude, you got to fix your house first. Why are you coming to me for answers? Yeah. Um, you're all over the place. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Well, we have a lot of history going to the government and it not improving things, only making it worse. We have this thing called HIPAA, which is <laughs> the uh, Healthcare Information, <laughs> Privacy, and Portability, Portability. Act. And it has three components to it, privacy, security, um, and finally, uh, administrative simplification in the billing process. And so they uh, enacted the privacy first, then the security, and finally kind of got around to, but never really provided much improvement on administrative simplification of billing. So they made us pay for all the other two with the promise that we'd save money on the other end by being able to easily submit <laughs> Uh, a bill electronically and uh, make it a lot simpler to get paid, which, you know, we've not really seen uh, that happen. So I don't really trust the government to fix it. I think <laughs> we've got to fix it. And Doug, I could fill another wall on all the flow chart that it would take us to give you that bill, to submit it <laughs> to you. Yeah. So uh, until we can work together uh, to simplify things, I don't think the government's going to be the answer. They're only going to make it try the regulatory efforts that occur in government just uh, only make a, a complicated thing more complicated from my perspective. Yeah. I, I agree. Every time we have something that comes out of CMS, it seems like we spend two years with consultants debating what it means before yeah. we actually do anything. <laughs> and then we're in trouble because we're late. Yeah. Or interpreted it wrong. <laughs> so it's always written in a way that depending upon what the mood of the moment, you can twist it in a lot of different ways. And, That's right. um, you know, I, I get it. It's hard and it's complex. And, and but that I, I think that my, my greatest fear is that an Elon Musk is going to come in and create a new system. You know, if you look at the, the revolutions of the, you know, some of the other industries, Blockbuster didn't make it, not because Blockbuster wasn't trying to do the best that they could, but somebody else came in with a better idea. And government's included in this, so that makes it mm -hmm. entry a lot higher. But at some point in time, I can tell you from a health plan standpoint, I'm sure the, the physicians feel this as well. The dissatisfaction with healthcare is higher than in the 20 plus years I've been involved with it. No, I know people who work for tobacco companies that are liked more than <laughs> some of the world's <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's funny. Uh, well, we have about 10 minutes left, so I'm going to move us to our last topic, which is about uh, now that we're nearing, hopefully, at least the, the post-peak season of the pandemic, now what? How do we recover? How do we reimagine? And we've been talking about some of that already, but I really want to focus in on, um, again, how do we, as, a, as, an or, as an industry that is typically somewhat resilient, but not necessarily good at reimagining, how are you all advising your clients? Dr. Lubitz, do you want to kick us off? Oh, sure. Wow. This is uh, not an easy topic because there are so many areas of healthcare that are uh, suffering post-COVID. And as I mentioned, um, a minus 3%, 3.5% margin means there's just not a lot of new money to put in. I think mental health is probably the greatest challenge that we're going to face. We've seen an enormous increase in mental health complaints for both patients 
and also for healthcare providers. We've seen an enormous increase in alcoholism. We've seen an increase in obesity and diabetes. Many patients have put off their chronic care, their preventive care. So we're in this big period of trying to just catch up, take a breath, catch up, and try to get people back into a rhythm of care. I do think that that creates opportunity, right? So uh, considering that we're, we're talking about uh, the digital revolution and, and uh, patient-centric care, uh, there will be great opportunities here for entrepreneurs to step in and find ways to provide additional forms and sources of patient-centric care um, uh, in partnership with um, these healthcare systems. But I think that in terms of what I advise right now, um, we have to look for ways to uh, decrease expenses that uh, are unnecessary, redirect resources to those things that are patients really need to get plugged back into the system. Mm -hmm. There is a, a loss of uh, or a fracturing uh, somewhat of the patient primary care provider uh, relationship. And so we've seen an increase in, in ED utilization. If we can start to redirect those low acuity ED cases uh, to urgent care and back into primary care systems, I think that will help decrease some of the burden. Uh, but that's, that's, that's where we're going. Uh, address the provider needs to, uh, as, as part of the quadruple aim. Um, uh, make, make sure that we're taking good care of them and making sure we're addressing the mental health and chronic, chronic disease and preventative needs. Certainly the, the mental health <clears throat> impacts from the pandemic have, have just been striking. Um, it's both illuminated and contributed to the existing crisis that um, we had, had experienced. Jerry, I know you've had some personal experience with someone close to you that was impacted by COVID and, and some mental health challenges. Do you mind sharing? No, thank you, Melinda. So I, I think it's one of the biggest gaps right now. I don't think we're gonna realize for many years just the impact from, a, from mental health, what, you know, who has been impacted, how it's been impacted, how we can help them. But this is one dear to my heart. So my daughter who, um, always has been known for her tenacity, her vivacious personality, outstanding academic career was heavily impacted during the pandemic. Uh, COVID presented at a critical time for her and her academic career, just at the time she was choosing which graduate program to attend, um, her mental health issues surfaced in part due to the isolation and the sheer weight of everything going on during the pandemic. And fortunately for her, she sought help through therapy and was able to receive care through telehealth. And for my daughter, it was good that she was able to get the help she needed. Yet for so many others, they, um, they don't have that available or they don't have access to that type of care. And um, during some conversations with Ian, I was so impressed while speaking with him and the work he is doing. And he's busy building bridges as he always does within the metaverse technologies. And I would love it if Ian, you could share a little bit about what you are doing in the mental health arena and just coming back from Dubai. Yeah, yeah, I uh, was, was um, honored to, to be invited to speak at the Health 2.0 conference in, in, in Dubai around uh, mental health and the metaverse. And um, there's a, topic that was uh, quite interesting but um uh, as, as you guys know we have a whole spectrum of how we look at mental health uh, throughout the world and um, i couldn't think of a better place to uh, bring up the topic of mental health than in the middle east as some of you might know uh, they are still incarcerating uh, patients who have uh, addictions and in some countries and i learned this by talking to folks down there um you're banished. Like I had a dad that was um, literally in tears crying because um, his son has a learning disability. And uh, in one of the countries there, there's only one school in the entire country that deals with learning disability. And the reason for this is a lot of people, they, um, again, you're banished. You have three kids, one has a disability, guess what? You now have two kids. Uh, they don't uh, homeschool them. They just don't do anything. I mean, it, it's it's a very sad fact, and um, uh, the work that I'm doing is, is really talking 
to, to different um, stakeholders in this space. Um, talking to a lot of the, the founders uh, of, of companies in the metaverse area and looking at what we can do to help patients uh, you know, experiencing mental illness and, and uh, from, from the whole spectrum. And um, I have good news. The good news is that of all the different companies that I've spoken to, they've all said that mental health is one of the best applications that they see for the metaverse. Uh, Grand Theft Auto, I'm not knocking it down, it's a great game, but uh, <laughs> uh, using it for, for, for mental health is something that even folks in the gaming industry are, are seeing as great opportunities. So I'm trying to uh, talk to uh, investors to see how we can get interest in this, but um, I'm not just looking for you know dollars uh, thrown my way in order to put this together. I'm looking for, for people with a passion in this area because it's, this is more than just building something. Unfortunately, they won't come. You have to change mind and hearts around mental health and then the technology will, will make sense. So, so that's what I'm working on. Uh, and, and I hope that you know we can make a dent uh, in this. And uh, I ended up talking to Dubai by saying, you know, all change ends with a big bang, but it starts with a whisper. And, and that conversation hopefully, you know, starts there and bringing it up here with you guys as well. Uh, so we can continue this conversation and, and take away the taboo around mental health. Thank you very much for sharing that, Ian. We are down to our last two minutes. We do not have any questions. So Alan, I'd like to turn it back to you to close us up. Great, I just sent a note out to everybody. Thank you for participating. And uh, as I mentioned, we have some interesting events coming up. So um, I know that sometimes these events are not, let's say the perfect fit for you maybe to talk about uh, I don't know, some of our uh, more technical topics, but your organization will certainly has someone who would be interested in those. So I'll just make the pitch here that now that you've become a member of our family, um, you're welcome to uh, let us know that you'd I'd like to nominate someone or yourself to attend future events. As I mentioned, we've got a neuroscience event coming up next month, and we've got an emotional quotient the month after. Uh, I want to thank Melinda, Jerry, and others for all the enormous amount of work that they put in over several months to try to put this event together. Uh, to put together a panel of speakers at, at this level is really in, impressive. You all have wonderful careers and uh, have great success. And the insights that you can give us are really helpful. Um, I don't know if everybody else was doing the same, but I was making a lot of mental notes as we were going through about how the challenges in healthcare are so similar to some of the very same challenges the rest of us face in other uh, industries, retail businesses, et cetera. We're always trying to find out how to uh, uh, influence the consumers to, um, to behave in certain ways to get the quality of service that they want at the same time to give us their attention and their dollars and their, um, and their love, which I can see, uh, I have much more sympathy now for the challenges that healthcare providers have. And I can see that these are really um, very big challenges. So thank you all for being here, for giving up your time uh, to speak to us today and for the many participants. Thank you so much for uh, setting aside this time to join us today. So I look forward to seeing many of you again next month. Thank you all so much for coming today. Thank you, everyone, Thank and you. thank you, panel.